All right, thank you everyone for coming. I'm going to be talking about uh, software lessons from the 1960s. My name is Larry Garfield. You may know me online as Krell. If you want to make fun of me on Twitter during the talk, that's where you do so. I highly encourage it. I'm the Director of Developer Experience at Platform SH, where a continuous deployment cloud hosting company. Um, I'm a member of the PHP FIG core committee. Uh, been involved in a number of major open source projects in the PHP space. And for those who get the joke, I, I do in fact implement PSR8. Who else gets that joke? <laughs> a couple of people, okay. Find Michelle Sandver, she can explain it to you. <laughs> this is a computer. This is a very old computer. Specifically, this is an IBM uh, System 360 Model 20. It was announced in 1964 as part of the System 360 line, which was the world's first complete range of compatible computers. What does that mean? This is the first time in history that we were building different computers that were compatible with each other, that could run the same software. This was an amazing innovation in 1964. And among other things, necessitated for the first time a distinction between the architecture of the system and the implementation. And it took two years to build because even in the 60s, no engineering project ever completed on time. Uh, but it shipped for over a decade. It's one of the most successful computer systems in history. And part of its advantage, one of the reasons it worked so well, was its separation between architecture and implementation, which meant that you could use it with the standard reel-to-reel -reel tape drives for storage, or you could use this crazy newfangled technology called spinning disks that could store thousands of bits of information in, in a box only this tall. <laughs> it's phenomenal. System 360 had a major uh, legacy on computing. <clears throat> uh, for example, why are bytes eight bits in size? Because System 360 decided they were eight bits in size. There is no inherent reason why a byte needs to be eight bits. In fact, before System 360, the most common size was six bits per byte. Which, fun story, six bits per byte doesn't allow you enough uh, numbers to have both uppercase and lowercase letters. So you know, computer systems at the time had to pick one. And some researchers did a study to figure out if we have to do all uppercase or all lowercase, which should we do? Which is easier to read? And they found all lowercase was, in fact, easier to read. And they took this uh, conclusion to their boss, who said, but we're IBM. We can't have our name in lowercase. <laughs> and so uppercase became the, all uppercase became the standard for the next 30 years, because technology. <laughs> System 360 also originated the idea of byte addressable memory, that is, you access pieces of memory at a byte offset. You can't access at a specific bit offset, just at a byte offset. This started with System 360. It also developed an encoding format called EBCDIC, which you've probably never heard of except in history books because nobody else used it. Uh, everyone used ASCII instead, and the rest is history. So, okay, win some, you lose some. System 360, in fact, lives on in the IBM Z series of uh, mainframe computers. Yes, you can still buy these. Yes, they still run software written for the System 360 40 some odd years ago, 50 years ago. And they do run PHP as well. So that's kind of cool. The lead team on System 360 uh, was these two people. Uh, the lead architect was Gene Andal, and the lead manager was a man named Fred Brooks. <coughs> Brooks is actually the one who coined the term computer architecture as a thing. After the project was over, most of the uh, major members of the team moved on to other projects. Many of them ended up in academia, like you do. And 10 years later, Brooks wrote a book based on uh, his experience working on System 360 and additional academic research that had happened in the intervening decade called The Mythical Man Month. <clears throat> and it's a collection of essays of lessons learned and uh, conclusions to draw on how to manage large-scale software projects. In come on, 1995, he published a follow-up uh, 20th anniversary edition in which he added a couple of chapters and went back to look at some of the things he had said 20 years earlier about how to manage large software projects. 
and ask, so is it still true? That, it, you know, it does, does anything change or is it still right? And his general conclusion was, yeah, it's still always true because computers change, humans don't. So what I'd like to do is do another retrospective. It's been 20 years and change. So let's look at, is it still valid? Is the stuff he was saying in 1975 still true? Now I'm gonna follow a different outline than uh, Brooks follows uh, here, but I'm uh, gonna cover most of the same material. Uh, two things I will note. One, one thing he did not get right is extreme overuse of male pronouns for absolutely no reason at all. Uh, nothing here is in any way gendered. I'm also gonna talk about a couple of open source projects here. I'm not picking on them specifically. They're just good examples for the points I'm trying to make. I could swap in a dozen others just as easily. With that said, who's heard of Brooks Law before? Who's heard of Brooks Law before? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah it's, it's that Brooks. Adding people to a late software project makes it later. Why? Why is that? Well, because communication is hard. This, this should sound familiar from the keynote this morning. Why is communication hard? Because the number of communication channels goes up faster than the number of communication nodes. The more people you add to a project, the more conversation lines there are. When you have two people on a team, there's one line of communication. Three people, there's three lines. Four people, there's six lines. Five people, there's 10 lines of communication. And so on and so on and so on. This is actually a mathematical formula for it, combinatorics. You don't need to worry about the math. You know, there's not gonna be a test on that. The bottom line being though, that the more people you have on a project, the more people have to coordinate and make sure they're on the same page. And that gets more and more hard the more people you add. Another problem is that tasks are not in fact parallelizable. <clears throat> this is a management talk, so of course there has to be a Dilbert reference. I hired all of you because this project will take 300 man days to complete. There are 300 of you, so I want you to finish by five o'clock and clean up your desks, you're all fired. <laughs> it doesn't actually work that way. It may seem like it's going to, but no, it doesn't. And this is true for a lot of reasons. Your resources are limited. You only have so many computers, so many chairs, so many servers. People have different skill levels. You have, you know, you can give a task to me, and if it's involving the database, I'm fine. I can take care of it very easily. Give me a task for in, in CSS, it's gonna take me longer than it takes someone else on the team because I'm just not as skilled in CSS as I am in SQL and PHP, and vice versa. <clears throat> Sometimes certain tasks will block others. I can't build the, the UI front end until we've designed the UI front end. I can't build the data model in the database until we've figured out what were data we actually want to store. Tasks block each other, despite what agile coaches like to say, and that will slow you down. And this is true even for unskilled tasks, not just for you know, professional work. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was helping friends of mine move from Chicago, where I'm from, to New York. And <clears throat> you know, they had, say, 100 boxes they needed to pack up into a moving van, and so, okay, they should get 100 friends together and everyone grabs a box, it will be done in about two minutes. <laughs> of course not. Yes, they had 100 friends, but you couldn't fit 100 people into their apartment at the same time. You, we only have one elevator, we only had two dollies, the whoever's packing the uh, van itself needs to be the person who's gonna unpack it to the other end so they know which boxes are fragile. It just doesn't work to throw people at this problem. And this is not even a hard task. It's not a complex task. It's not one where you need high skill for it. And still, throwing people at a problem doesn't help. <clears throat> one thing we never figured out though is why anyone would want to move from Chicago to New York, but that's another story. <laughs> Fundamentally though, people and months are interchangeable commodities only when a task can be partitioned among workers with no communication among them. If you have to talk to each other, you, the task is no longer parallelizable. <coughs> Adding people makes the project longer. More Dilbert, of course. How long will your project take if I add two more people? Well, add one month for training, 
One month for the extra complexity, and one month for dealing with their drama, because people suck. You, know, it, you can't just throw people at a problem, especially later. The later you add, <coughs> the later you add people to a project, the more time you have to spend getting them up to speed. So, you know, if you add people early in a project, then you might be able to get away with it. The later it is, the less useful it is to just add people. It also depends on the number of swim lanes. Swim lanes, it's a concept from Agile. It roughly translates to the number of people that can work on a project at the same time without bumping into each other. I can work on this part, you can work on this part, and our code is not going to collide when we make pull requests. That's basically a swim lane. And a given project will have a natural number of swim lanes in it where more than this many people working on it are just going to produce Git conflicts more than code. And a, you, adding more people than that to a project is a complete waste. I will usually argue that the maximum number of developers on a project is number of swim lanes plus one. That gives you code review people, that gives you time for someone to get sick or go on vacation and so forth. <coughs> That's number of developers, that doesn't count project managers and, and, and so on. But there's still a natural limit to the number of people you can add to a project, and that's going to vary by project. This is true not just for people, but for technology too. This is Amdahl's law, same Gene Amdahl we just talked about, which, quote, gives the theoretical speed up in latency of the execution of a task at fixed workload that can be expected of a system whose resources are improved. Translation. This is the formula for the more parallel something is, the more CPUs you can throw at it before it doesn't make sense to throw more CPUs at it. And even in a technical task here, again, ignore the math, that's not relevant, more, the more parallelizable the, uh, the task, the more CPUs you can throw at it before it becomes a waste, but there's still a cap. Even something that is 95% parallelizable, more than about 1,000 processors, it's not worth it. You're not going to get any additional benefit. For most tasks, it's down here, like eight, which is the same for people. So what do you think? True? Is he right? Uh, yep, I'm going to say yes. This is completely true, and it's true not just for technical topics. For example, when I first gave this talk, uh, I was complaining on Twitter that there's just too much good content in the book. It's an excellent book, and I was not going to be able to cover more than about half the material in it. So someone helpfully suggested I get a second speaker on stage and give both halves of the talk simultaneously. <laughs> yeah, that didn't work. But now that we're thinking about it, though, isn't it a very common problem in open source that large open source projects will just try to throw warm bodies at a problem and say, we just need more developers, we need more volunteers, we need more contributors? Do we know any projects that do that? I know one. <laughs> I worked on it for years. How many lines of communication is that? Too many. What can we learn from this? Point two. Why are your estimates always wrong? There's a lot of reasons. Brooks argues it's because you're estimating the wrong thing. <coughs> When you make an estimate, as a developer, you're estimating the time it takes to write a program. This is not useful. If you want something that is an actual programming system, that is formalized interfaces, uh, good, good system integration, <clears throat> something that's you know, fully documented and so on, then that's three times as much work as just writing your proof of concept program. If you want a programming product, that is something that you can build on, something that's generalized, something that's well tested, something that has <coughs> uh, good documentation, something that has a maintenance process set up. You're looking at three times as much work as your, your you know, build it in your garage prototype. Which means if you want an actual programming system product that is a robust, extensible thing you can actually use, you're looking at nine times as much effort as your initial, I can prove that the program works. Nine times. <clears throat> if your, your estimate, just fast, fast garage project, or I think I can do it in this much time, that's just this. And that's just naturally how developers think. Brooks also notes that a substantial bank of test cases exploring the input range and probing its boundaries must be prepared, 
run and recorded. Translation, automated testing was already a thing in 1975. You don't have an excuse. I hear some nervous laughter. <laughs> Note, this doesn't mean that testing takes three times as long. It means finding all the bugs that you find through good automated testing will take three times as long. Putting the bugs in there, that's free. I would also ask, how fast can you code? Just think for a moment, how fast can you code? You're wrong, because I didn't give you enough information. Extrapolation of time for the 100 yard dash show that a man should be able to run a mile in under three minutes. The current world record is three minutes, 43 seconds. Because you can't run at 100 yard dash speeds for a whole mile. Humans can't do that. Longer distances, you're going to run slower. A marathon, even slower. <coughs> and uh, Brooks found that <coughs> there was actual economic research on this point, which found that the effort to add more code to a system was a factor of the number of instructions already in the system raised to a power, or visually like that. The more code there is in the system, the harder it is to add more code. That's true even if there's no communication. This is true for a one-person project. Why? Because there are more interaction points internally within the code, which means more things that can go wrong when you change this code or add this code, this something over here will break because of code. Also, just the limits of human memory. You can only fit so much conception of the application in your head at once. Once your program gets big, too big for you to fit in your head, you will slow down because you have to change what you're thinking about and reload your brain with this other part of the system. Another study found that productivity in large systems <coughs> uh, varied depending on the number of interactions, both people and within the code base. And the difference between very few interactions and a lot of interactions is almost an order of magnitude. I'm not quite sure what very few and many meant in this study, um, but large meant 25 programmers and 30,000 instructions. In just a system that size, you have nearly a, a tenfold difference in productivity based on the number of interactions you have. Now, someone will probably point out that that study was done on assembly. That's why we said instructions. However, you know, no one writes in assembly anymore, I hope. Anyone here write in assembly? Good. However, follow-up studies found PL1, which is kind of like the C of the 1970s, followed the exact same curve, but for statements, not instructions. What does that mean? It means a more expressive language, a language that gives you more power per line of code you write, is more productive because you will need to write less code to get more functionality, so you stave off that problem of it being too big to fit on your brain for longer. But you can't do it forever. That same problem is still there no matter what language you're writing in. Bigger program means you will move slower. What do you think? True? This fit? Yep. I'm going to say he's two for two. Of course, there's that one little catch. 25 programmers and 30,000 instructions counts as large. Anyone want to guess? <laughs> what can we learn from this? <laughs> yes, but that's something else entirely. How about planning and documentation? These are the same thing. These go hand in hand. <clears throat> and Brooks argues that you need to write upfront documentation. Why? Because only when one writes do the gaps appear and inconsistencies protrude. The act of writing turns out to require hundreds of mini decisions, and it is the existence of those that distinguishes clear, exact policies from fuzzy ones. Describing what it is you're trying to do in words is like rubber ducking with your word processor. I used to be a consultant uh, building sites, mostly for universities, and every project I had the same experience. We'd go on site with the client, talk to them for days, watch them do their thing, do you know, workshops and so on, come back to the office, sit down, start writing out in 
a Google Doc, what we, we were going to build, exactly what we had discussed, and inevitably, okay, what happens in this case though? We didn't talk about that. But what happens when this is empty? What happens when there's no data here? What happens in this edge case? That I didn't think about when I was talking to them, but I thought about when I sat down to write it back. It happened to me all the time. The crucial task is to get the product defined. Many, many failures concerned exactly those aspects that were never quite specified. Basically, if you don't know what you're building, you're never going to build it well. But the manual or written specification is a necessary tool, but not a sufficient one. The code is your formal definition of what the program does, and it is very precise, sometimes overly precise. But it's not very readable. It doesn't explain why. The why you're doing something is for pros. Whether that is comments or out-of-band out documentation, you need to have the why written down. Because if you can't justify the why, you shouldn't be doing it. And forcing yourself to justify the why may tell you, I don't actually need to do this. And this requires, Brooks argues, top-down design. Architect your system first and then refine it top down to produce modules. <coughs> then recurse that process, break each module down into sub-modules and sub-sub-modules until you have a picture of how your system fits together, until you have an architecture. And then implement each module individually, debug each one separately, important point, and when you run into a problem, you can inform back up and refactor your architecture. Basically, divide and conquer which is the standard approach in any scientific endeavor. Take a hard problem, break it up into a bunch of simple problems, and then put them back together. That should be your first go-to in any problem. He also notes, plan to, f to throw one version away. You will anyway, so you might as well plan for it. Basically, you don't know what you're going to do wrong until you've already done it wrong. It takes doing it wrong to figure out what right even means. Who, who's old enough to remember the joke, Microsoft never gets uh, version one right, they always take to version three to get it right? Am I the only one that old in here, please? <laughs> okay, a couple of people, yeah. It's not just Microsoft, that's everybody. They just got a bad rap for it. Now at this point, I'm sure someone in here is going, but Larry, you're talking about waterfall. We all know that's terrible. We all know that's not what you should do. I mean, even the, you know, the government said you shouldn't do that when people did it anyway and blamed the government. And in Brooks's follow-up edition, he said, boy, yeah, I just described waterfall, didn't I? All right, let's revise that. Design top-down, but implement iteratively. Start by building an end-to-end -end skeleton. This end-to-end -end skeleton does not necessarily do anything interesting, but it has the most uh, important attribute that it will compile, or in our case, it will respond to an HTTP request. And it has a general structure of what your application is going to be. <coughs> then you can grow modules into place on that skeleton, like you're growing organs onto a skeleton that's already there. And if along the way you decide, hey, I need to just replace this piece entirely, you can, because it's nice and a separate piece. If you need to iteratively work on a particular piece, you can do that. If you want to move them around, you can do that. <coughs> and you know, one thing to note, building that initial skeleton could take a while. That first step you know, could easily be 40% of your total project development time. So it's, it's not something you do in one sprint. But you need to get that baseline in place that you can then iterate on. This should sound familiar. This is refactoring. Refactoring is the art of throwing away version one a little bit at a time. This approach, however, necess necessitates top-down design for his top-down growing of the software. Also, common sense, if not common practice, dictates that one should begin system debugging only after the pieces seem to work. Who actually follows this part? Not enough hands are up. Architect top-down, but debug bottom-up. Now at this point, that same person is probably going, but Larry, you just described Agile. Who's seen this picture before for how to do Agile? This is wrong. Please don't do this. When was the last time you ever successfully evolved a skateboard into a car? <laughs> I've never pulled it off. 
This is the better picture. You don't start with something that is not even remotely what you want to build, because you cannot turn that into that. If you need to get from Los Angeles to Chicago, or from London to Moscow, you're not going to build a bicycle. It will never work. You can't evolve it into what you need. You start with an airplane. In this case, if you want a car, you start with something that's kind of a car. It's missing pieces. That's OK. But it still has a steering wheel, wheels, and an engine. And then you can iterate on that and add cargo space, and change the paint, and change the doors, and change the, the tires, and move closer to what you actually want. But you, the entire time, you have a car. Your basic architectural concept hasn't changed. This also means, contrary to what agile coaches will tell you, you do not build the most important user feature first. Why? You have to build the foundation first. If you're building a house, and you're, the homeowner tells you that the most important thing for them in the house is having a fireplace on the, in a second floor bedroom, the first thing you build is not a fireplace on the second floor bedroom. You don't have a second floor or a bedroom. The first thing you do is pour concrete. That's where you have to start, because otherwise you don't have a foundation to build from. And that foundation has to start close to what you're going to build. You can't start by using a tent and then, then building the fireplace and then re so replacing the foundation. It just doesn't work that way. So what do you think? True? Still true? Yep. I'm going to say yes. At least two and a half for three with, with the revisions. In his follow-up edition uh, in 1995, <coughs> Brooks included an additional essay called No Silver Bullet, based on a presentation he'd given at a conference in 1986. In it, he draws a distinction between essential complexity and accidental complexity. Essential complexity is, this is hard because the problem space is hard. It's just fundamentally the, the problem we're dealing with is a hard problem. Accidental complexity is, the tools are hard to use. Who's done e-commerce sites before? They're, they're hard, aren't they? They suck. Why? Because tax law sucks. And you have to deal with all of that nonsense. E-commerce is a fundamentally hard problem. It's not because your tools are bad. Some of the tools are bad, but that's another story. You will never have a, an e-commerce tool that is so well built that the problem of e-commerce just disappears. That's not a thing. The hard part of building software is the specification design and testing of the conceptual construct, not the labor of representing it and testing the fidelity of the representation. Remember, Brooks was originally working at a time when to debug your program, you picked up your stack of, of punch cards, walked down the hall to the elevator, took the elevator down to the basement, walked down the hall to the room with the computer, because there's only one, handed it to the, the computer operator, went back to your office, came back two hours later, and the operator would say, here's your stack of cards, that, for card 497 failed, good luck. And you went back up to your office and stared at card 497 until you figure out what your syntax error was. That's accidental complexity. That's not a fundamental hard problem of computing. That's the tools were bad. We have come a long way from there. And product, you know, the productivity of programmers today is vastly more than it was then because we've solved those problems. And we've run out of those problems. There is no single development which by itself promises even one order of magnitude improvement in productivity, simplicity, or reliability. There is room for improvement. Better tools, better languages, better compilers, better you know, IDEs, whatever. But nothing like moving from punch cards to a laptop that can run an entire building sitting in front of me. So how do we attack essential complexity? <clears throat> how do we make ourselves more productive when we've solved all the easy stuff? Brooks argues three, uh, offers three options. Rapid prototyping where you grow organically based on user feedback. We already talked about this one, so I won't go into it any further. Buy versus build, and mentor better architects. Brooks argues that the most radical solution for constructing software is to not construct it at all. Remember, in the 60s and 70s, hardware for a computer could easily cost $20 million. If you're spending $50,000 custom writing all of the software for it, that's a rounding error on your budget. Your accountants won't even notice. These days, you can get a computer this big for 10 bucks. 
that is more powerful than NASA was 15 years ago and co comes with storage and RAM and everything. You just plug in a keyboard and a monitor and you're ready to go. Hardware is not the cost anymore. Hardware is dirt cheap, which means relative to that, software has gotten more expensive because its cost has stayed the same. It's human time. So how do we get more productive at producing software? By reusing more software. If you, know, you need to write a web server, why would you write a web server? There's already several you can just pick up and use. If you need a spreadsheet, why would you write your own spreadsheet program? There's several you can just pick up and use. Some pay for some free. What you want to do is produce reusable components that you can just pull off the shelf and use rather than having to rewrite every time. Now, he didn't use the term, but what Brooks described just now is open source. That is exactly the point of open source. This is the number one productivity improvements of the last 20 years in software. Actually, it's now 25 years. If you're doing software and you're building software systems, and open source doesn't make up at least 80 or 90% of your code base, you are wasting money. End of story, period. There is so much good code out there that you can just use. Why would you waste your time and money rewriting it? The way to be more productive is to write less code. The way to, be, to write less code is to reuse more code. Brooks also argues we need to grow great designers. Because fundamentally, software construction is a creative process. Study after study shows the very best designers produce structures that are faster, smaller, simpler, cleaner, and produced with less effort. The difference between the great and the average approaches an order of magnitude. Oh my god, 10x developer, this discrimination, this pri privilege, blah, 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 blah. No, 10x designer. The best developer in the world is not going to be able to produce lines of code 10 times faster than a, a mediocre one. But that's not the point. The best designers, the best architects, will be able to design a system that requires 10 times less code to be written in the first place. That's what you want. 10 times less, less code also means 10 times fewer places for bugs to get, to get in. Software architecture is far more like graphic design than engineering. <clears throat> it's a different mindset than producing code. Architecture is a separate skill set from development, and it requires recognition within an organization on par with management. Your senior level managers and your senior level architects are equally important jobs and need to be equally respected and represented within the company in terms of whatever perks that means, salary, you know, office, offices, time at conferences, whatever you know, rank means in your company. Your senior level architects need to have that same recognition as senior management. <clears throat> How do you get those people? Through mentoring. Identify candidates early on. These may not be the best developers. They should be a decent developer so they know what they're talking about, but your best developer may not be your best architect. That's a different skill set. Give those people a career mentor. Active mentoring. Give them someone they can bounce ideas off of who can actively work with them to help shape their career as a designer, as an architect. Give them apprenticeships. Give them formal education to have them take coursework on that. Give them opportunities to work on projects solo as the only architect, work with a, a senior architect on larger projects, get them to collaborate with other designers, send them to conferences like this one where they can collaborate with other designers. All of these are things that the design world does already. We should too, because architecture is fundamentally a design discipline, not a computer science discipline. What do you think? True? Yeah, not, I see nodding. Yeah, I agree. Totally my experience, uh, both on open source and on <coughs> uh, architects being more like designers. And finally, Brooks's key point on conceptual integrity. The conceptual integrity of the product as perceived by the user is the most important factor in ease of use. As perceived by the user. You want to have one mental model. If the user has one mental model, it's easier to use. But what does ease of use mean? Ease of use is not just an absolute number. Ease of use is a relationship between the amount of functionality versus the complex, conceptual complexity the user needs to keep track of. 
in order to be able to get that functionality. Think of 3D, 3D modeling software, stuff like Lightwave, Blender, 3D Studio Max. Those are ridiculously complicated programs. You need to take a formal class to learn how to use them in the first place, and it takes years to get good at it. But boy, can you produce some amazing things with them. That's an easy to use program relative to what you can do with it. Compare that with a text editor, you know, your basic text editor uh, on your system. Very low functionality. It does one thing and that's it. And it takes about 45 seconds to learn how to do it. So is Windows Notepad just as easy to use as, as Lightwave? One could make that argument. Insert Vim joke here. Simplicity and straightforwardness proceed from conceptual integrity. <clears throat> in fact, Brooks argues conceptual integrity is the most, Im consider most important consideration in system design. It is better to have a consistent design than more features. See also the original iPhone, which had no copy-paste, which had no app store, which has no uh, high-speed WAN, really just lacking all the features that everyone thought of a phone like that should have. But the few things it did, it did extraordinarily well. And they've sold a trillion of them so far, so it seemed to have worked out. Conceptual integrity of the product not only makes it easier to use, it makes it easier to build and less subject to bugs. Just like you want the user to only have one set of nouns in their brain to keep track of, you want the developers to have only one set of nouns to keep track of in their brain. If they're using one set of words over here and another set of words over here, they're going to get confused and have bugs where things just don't line up properly. You've probably heard this before. It's called ubiquitous language. Exact same concept, just different words and 20 years earlier. So how do you have that? <clears throat> how do you have that good conceptual integrity? Through smart division of labor. In fact, Brooks argues, and this somewhat disagrees with the keynote this morning, the design must proceed from one mind or a very small number of agreeing resonant minds. <clears throat> this is not monothink, but it's not conflict think. If you have different overlapping opinions of how software should work, of what the program should do sitting in the same code base, you have a mess. We've all worked on those systems, I'm sure. Brooks suggests two ways that you can get this. One is the surgical team, it's inspired by a, uh, you know, an actual surgical team with a doctor where you have a surgeon who's doing nothing but operating. And there's you know, nurses all around her who can take care of different things and hand her different things and keep the, the client, I mean the family, away so that she can focus on the operation and nothing else. I've never actually seen this happen in software, so let's ignore it. <laughs> the other is to split the architect from the implementer. These are separate jobs that should be done by separate people. The architect is the user's agent. It is their job to bring professional and technical knowledge to bear in the unalloyed interest of the user, as opposed to the salesman or fabricator or whoever. They are the user's advocate. You want the user's advocate to be in charge of how the system conceptually works. That's their job. And at this point, I'm sure someone is going to say, but Larry, that's cathedral design. Cathedral in the Bazaar, you don't want aristocracy. You don't want this you know, you know, top-down dictatorial design. Cathedrals are still standing. I like cathedrals. Cathedrals are amazing examples of architecture. And they stand for centuries. How many of your programs have stood for centuries? I hope none of you answer yes to that. <laughs> I'd, I'd be kind of concerned. Look at Apple. <clears throat> Apple has a lot of good designers working at it. They have a lot of good engineers. But at the end of the day, Johnny Ives is calling the shots. What Johnny Ives says the product is going to be is what the product is, end of story. At Google, they have tons of designers working on different products all over the place, but at the end of the day, Matthias Duarte is the one who decides what the, the Google brand is and what the design is and how it works. If you're working on any kind of Unix-based system, guess what? You're using the POSIX standard. If you don't follow that standard, your program is wrong because that's the architecture that you're working with. And if you don't follow it, your program will not work with anything else correctly. Same on the web. We're working with HTTP. You don't like how HTTP works. You don't like how HTTP caching works. That's too bad. You inherited this architecture. You get to work with it, or you get to produce crap. Those are the options. These are both challenging 
fields. Architect is designing watch style in hands for those who still have you know, circular analog watches. The implementer is building gears and, des and Dells. Both of these are fun. Both of these are challenging. But they're different jobs. The architecture needs to support multiple implementations of that same concept. <clears throat> it also means the architect must always be prepared to show an implementation, but not dictate the implementation. The architect needs to demonstrate, I'm not asking you to do something impossible. But once he's demonstrated it's possible, then it's not their job to say, this is the way you must do it. This requires constant, ongoing, collaborative uh, effort with a high degree of communication. So you still have your whole team involved. This whole team is still in putting in value. They're helping with the design. But at the end of the day, there is a person whose job it is to say, we're going to do it this way, and we're all going to do it this way, so that we aren't continuing to fight about this and produce crap code as a result. Democratic architecture is called MUD. And yes, I have worked on democratic architecture, and yes, it is MUD. You can also divide and conquer. Have, if you have a large enough system, you have sub-architects responsible for different pieces. That also reduces your lines of communication, and that's your team scale because your individual teams talk just to that local architect, and then the local architects talk to the main architect. Yes, this is a hierarchy. Yes, it works. See also the Linux kernel. See also Windows. See also any really large-scale project that doesn't change itself every 10 minutes uh, and, and break. Do we know any systems, any, any projects, that don't have a consistent uh, conceptual integrity? that are therefore kind of really hard to pick up and don't make any sense and annoy people with how little sense things make? <laughs> what can we learn from this? Now, one question here. We're talking about big systems. How big is big? <clears throat> After teaching a software engineering lab more than 20 times, I came to insist that student teams as small as four people choose a manager and separate architect. Four, manager, architect, two implementers. Either the manager or the architects can be the, the boss. Either one of them can have final authority. It works either way as long as everyone agrees on which is which. But those are separate jobs, even for a team as small as four. So what shall we learn from all of this? Software construction is fundamentally a creative process. When in doubt, divide and conquer is your strategy for, well, anything, because it works. You want to build shareable programming system products, which you can then release as open source, because that is how you move faster, by having code that you can reuse in multiple places. To do that effectively, keep your libraries decoupled from your framework. Grow your libraries into place within, your, within the framework, but don't integrate them too tightly because you want to be able to change them and change the framework independently. This requires top-down design, so you know how those pieces are going to fit together. And you need to empower architects to make decisions. You need to empower the people to say, we've looked at it, I've, we've talked to everyone on the team, we've gotten everyone's input, we're going this way. Because if some people are going this way and some people are going this way, then the customer is going that way. The idea that people knew a thing or two in the 70s is kind of strange to a lot of young programmers. From Donald Knuth, author of The Art of Computer Programming and considered the father of analysis of algorithms. What can we learn from this? Thank you.